Hey everyone, I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. So welcome to today's Rupa Live class presented by the all-new Rupa University, the best way to learn about specialty lab work from industry experts. My name, as always, is Adrian Martinez. I will be your host for this afternoon. Today, we have a very, very special guest in Dr. Elizabeth Seymour of Real-Time Laboratories, here to talk about behind the curtain of mycotox testing. Uh, before jumping in, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Everyone joining will be muted by default, but don't fret. If you do have any questions, please use that Q&A button in your menu bar, and we'll host a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Immediately following the Q&A, yours truly will show you exactly how to order these tests right on Rupa Health. And if you have to jump early, no worries at all. We are recording this session, as I just mentioned a moment ago, and you'll be able to have access to that at rupauniversity.com, as well as we'll go ahead and send out a recording along with the slides in the coming days. And if you are a fan of this type of content, be sure to check out rupauniversity.com to learn all about the different educational opportunities that we offer here at Rupa Health. So with that, Let's go ahead and jump in. I'd like to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Seymour. Originally from Denton, Texas, Dr. Seymour received her bachelor's at Texas Women's University and obtained her medical diploma at St. Matthew's University School of Medicine on Grand Cayman Island. Very jealous that you got to spend some time out there and completed her residency at Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center. Dr. Seymour is board certified in family medicine and also holds a master's degree in health services administration and was named a fellow of the American Academy of Family Medicine in 2018. She currently works as a physician at Environmental Health Center of Dallas and as a medical consultant for real-time laboratories in Carrollton, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Very excited about today's conversation and to get the ball rolling. I'll go ahead and let you take it from here, Dr. Seymour. Great. Thanks for having me. Well, let me get my screen shared and we will start. So I'm Dr. Seymour as introduced, and we're going to pull the curtain back and look a little bit deeper into mycotoxin testing and mold testing. So who are we? I am obviously a medical consultant for real-time laboratories. We're located in Carrollton, Texas, and we're a patient-focused laboratory that is dedicated to serving patients and the public by looking past the surface level uh, diagnoses of chronically ill patients. They'll come in with multiple symptoms, they'll have labeled diagnoses, and um, we want to try and help uncover why they are truly sick, why they have their symptoms, and how to help them both clinically and environmentally. So we receive clinical and, and, and environmental samples from both domestic and international patients in over 40 countries of the world. Our qualifications include that we are CAP accredited, which is the College of American Pathologists. We also have accreditation through CLIA, which is the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments since 2007. And we pride ourselves on the fact that we have the fastest turnaround times in the industry. Usually once we receive a specimen, we can get it um, processed and have results to you within seven to 10 business days. The other thing that makes us unique is that we have over three decades worth of research. So we've built a team with medical physicians and PhDs and RNs and done lots of research that we've published to help people understand mycotoxins and why they are concerned specifically for human health. So what are mycotoxins? Mycotoxins are basically a mold poison. So they're considered a toxin that is produced by um, the mold, which is within the fungal kingdom. And these are very small particles, nanoparticles, so you cannot visualize or see them. And they are toxic to humans. They're also toxic to other animals, specifically mammals. They can hurt dogs, they can hurt cats, they can hurt horses. There are hundreds that have been identified, but we are only focusing and testing on a small portion of those mycotoxins because they're associated with indoor molds and they pose a human health risk. Real-time lab tests for 16 of the mycotoxins that are considered most toxigenic. And we also um, look at testing the environment, which I'll go into, but we also test in the urine, which comes obviously from the body um, to see if you have mycotoxins coming out of your urine. And this little chemical composition down here at the bottom is a trichothecene molecule, which is a type of mycotoxin that we'll talk about. So where do you find mycotoxins? 
Um, the mycotoxins that we test for at real time lab are usually going to be found in indoor environments. So your home, a workplace, a building, and most of these facilities have some problem with water damage. Any city or town that has been flooded regularly, or if it's hot and it stays humid, tropical areas that you would consider, um, usually these are going to see an increase in mold production. Mold is also commonly found after natural disasters like hurricanes, tropical storms, flash floods. I give the example that we had in February of 2021 it was called the Texas Ice Apocalypse, and we didn't actually have flooding, but we had um, such cold weather and snow and ice that uh, our electricity went out in our homes and our workplaces. The temperature dropped easily down to 30 or 40 degrees within our home and many patients had uh, pipes that had busted. And so that was a setup for water leaks and floods and mold growth and potentially mycotoxin uh, formation and exposure. So exposure to toxigenic molds and mycotoxins, the most common way that you're gonna get exposed to these is through contamination via inhalation, breathing it in, or also through dermal absorption. We do get questions about, can you ingest mycotoxins, which you can. Um, I would hope that most of us are not eating a moldy piece of bread. <laughs> you know, that's obviously a way that you can get exposed to mold and mycotoxins, but you can also get very sick from that. Um, the questions that we get often are, do you test for specific foods? And we do not. There are different regulators such as the FDA and the USDA that are monitoring different uh, companies that produce food to prevent um, mycotoxin growth and mycotoxin contamination of foods, but we will only be testing for people and, and animals for mycotoxins. So there are, like we said, multiple mycotoxins. The ones that we test for, we put in a group um, and those are broken down into five different groups. The first one that you'll see on your left is the microcilic trichothecene group. All those listed mycotoxins below are a part of the trichothecene family. On the top right, we have our aflatoxin group. And then below that we have ochratoxin A, gliotoxin and zeralinone. So let's start with aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is a family of fungal strains that comes from affected plant products. When patients or animals are exposed to mycotoxins that are specifically aflatoxin, there's links that show you can get liver cancer, you can have liver failure, you can have cirrhosis of the liver, hepatitis, and other health issues. Exposures usually occur when an animal or a human is consuming contaminated plant products or eating a meat or dairy from animals that have eaten contaminated feed, or if you're inhaling dust while working with contaminated products. So you would think of, I'm being from Texas, we're a farm, farm girl um, and we ride horses. If there's a horse that is eating hay that has been um, cut up and it's wet, uh, wet hay will increase the risk of mold and mycotoxin growth, and a horse can eat that and then be exposed to mycotoxins. The next mycotoxin we test for is ochratoxin A. Ochratoxin A is a toxin produced by the aspergillus and penicillium species of mold, and it's one of the most abundant food contaminating mycotoxins. It's frequently found in contaminated water damaged buildings or homes. And uh, many of the sources of mycotoxin production with ochratoxin is from heating ducts and AC vents. Exposure can also come when you're inhaling the ochratoxin A through your lungs um, while being in a water damaged building. So it doesn't just have to be your home, it can be your workplace as well. The next mycotoxin that we test for is the big group, which is the macrocylic trichothecene group. This includes nearly 170 types of toxins, and they can thrive on plant and crop products, but they're more common in the soil and then decaying organic matter. It's usually, again, found in water damaged buildings, and there are several types of trichothecenes, most commonly coming from the mold Stachybotrys, also known as black mold. The next mycotoxin that we have is gliotoxin. Gliotoxin is a known immunosuppressant. It's found again in many homes and buildings that are affected with water damage. 
but it primarily affects individuals that have a compromised immune system. And for, for this reason, it's considered deadly. So there is a condition called invasive aspergillosis, or, or what we have short on here is IA. And um, when you are exposed to this type of aspergillosis fungus, it produces high levels of gliotoxin, and it's one of the leading causes of death in immunocompromised patients. The next is zeralinone, which is our last mycotoxin. It's mainly produced by the fusarium fungi. And this one um, actually competes with your estrogen receptors. It's a uh, hormone mimicker, and it looks very similar to estrogen. So when it hits the estrogen receptor, it produces a physiologic hormonal response that can lead to reproductive disorders. You can have low sperm count. You can have abnormal levels of progesterone. You can have ovulation disruption, disruption and infertility. There are women that complain they have very infrequent periods or um, heavy, painful periods. Uh, when babies are born, if a mother is exposed to this in and the baby is in utero, they can have a reduced birth weight and also have a lower chance of survival. So this is just kind of a brief summary of the mold species that produce the specific mycotoxin. So we'll go down from the top left. Uh, the first one is Aspergillus flavus and Aspergillus parasiticus. If you look to the right, that type of mold produces aflatoxin, short for AT. Continuing to go down, we have multiple different versions of Aspergillus, but we also get into the penicillium family, and these are known to produce ochratoxin A. Then we have Stachybotrys, and that produces the trichothecene mycotoxin. Another one is Trichoderma, which also produces the trichothecenes. And then if you continue to go down, Aspergillus versicolor and Aspergillus fumigatus produce gliotoxin. And then lastly, fusarium molds produce zeralinone mycotoxin. We also test for candida. Candida is probably the most common fungal infection that patients get. Um, obviously women can get candidal yeast infections in their vaginal canals. Um, some patients will get skin infections under their breast or in, under skin folds and um, have a red rash and it'll itch. That can as well be candida. So I do want to let you know that we can test for different, um, different types of candida, albicans, cruzis, galbarata, tropicalis, paraphysiosis, and the last one is candida oris which is not uh, very common to find a mold, um, I'm sorry, a lab that can test for this specific type of candidal strain. This is a urine specimen that patients submit, and it's a single amplification PCR test. Another, again, common mold that patients may be exposed to is Aspergillus. So we can test for Aspergillus niger, Aspergillus flavus, Aspergillus fumigatus, and Aspergillus teres. And the samples uh, vary in regards to that. You can do a blood sample. We can also do tissue sampling. We can do nasal swabs and we can do buccal swabs. And similar to Candida, it's a single amplification PCR for fungal DNA. So how do mycotoxins present specifically in your patients and what are the common symptoms that they'll express and experience? There are a list of them, and many of our patients that we see with mold sensitivity, mold allergy, mold exposure, and mycotoxin levels that are elevated in their body usually hit all of these types of symptoms. They come in with a chief complaint that's 20, 20 symptoms long, um, but I'll give you some common things to consider. The first is your uh, GI tract, gastrointestinal disorders. So if you have a patient that's been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, that's usually a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning you're testing for multiple things and ruling out celiac and Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And then once you do this million dollar workup, if you don't know, if nothing comes back positive, then you're going to say they most likely have irritable bowel syndrome, which doesn't have a lot of good options in regards to treatment. The symptoms would include nausea, diarrhea, possible constipation, abdominal bloating, cramps. Um, it goes on and on and on the types of symptoms that patients can have. The next is joint pains and weakness. 
These are our patients that are commonly diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Their muscles hurt, they're weak, they're tired, their joints are swollen. Then we go down to the common allergy symptoms. I like to call this the Zyrtec commercial of symptoms. So if patients get a lot of sneezy, itchy, wheezy, rashy, runny nose, congestion, um, watery eyes, they usually will start to develop sinus congestion, which can lead into sinusitis, which is a sinus infection. And then asthma as well. Asthma is noted to have coughing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, wheezing, um, maybe some sputum production, but mostly it, it's just they can't breathe. Headaches, uh, specifically migraines, um, can occur. And we see a lot of patients with neurologic symptoms that makes them feel like their brain is inflamed. Some patients will have MRIs or CAT scans that show brain lesions. And that would be concerning as a physician to me, To I would be concerned that if I saw brain lesions, I would think multiple sclerosis. But, um, you know, they, they, you want to make sure they don't have tumors in their brain or any type of brain cancer. Um, probably the most common symptom that we get is fatigue. I'm tired, doctor. I don't have any energy. And usually these patients have had a full workup with they're not anemic, they don't have sleep apnea, they don't have thyroid problems, and they, again, again get ruled out for common conditions that would cause the symptom of fatigue. Then they officially get labeled with chronic fatigue syndrome. The shortness of breath, again, co correlates back with the allergy component and the asthmatic component where patients feel like they just can't breathe. Going back again to neuro neurologic dysfunction is your cognitive impairments and your cognitive dysfunction. The patients will say they have brain fog. So that's not a diagnosis I can give a patient, but that's how they express it. They will be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, and they'll feel like they're 90 years old and they have dementia. They will be um, adults that never struggled with ADD or ADHD, and maybe their primary doc has put them on stimulant medication like Adderall and Vyvanse to help them concentrate and help them focus. But many of these patients have the brain fog, they can't think clearly, their memory is bad, they can't remember what they were doing, they can't organize well, um, they lose that executive function it seems. Some will have slurred speech, and again, they most likely will be confused. We'll sometimes have patients that have hearing problems. So the first thing you think of is a station tube dysfunction, which is the tube in the inner ear that gets clogged or plugged or, or narrowed. Um, and commonly you'll have patients that say, my ears are plugged. I feel like I'm on a plane. You know, they'll be trying to clear their ears and they can't. Um, and then the other symptom that they may have is tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. We'll also have dermatologic problems. So the skin gets affected where you'll have rashes, you'll have hives, welts. Some patients will have bloody skin lesions like spontaneous bruising or hemangiomas that may occur. And then the last one is hormone imbalance. And that's a generalization for hormones, but specifically sex hormones in males and females. So if you have something like zeralinone, which is an estrogen mimicker and hits the estrogen receptor, um, do you have an imbalance in your estrogen and progesterone levels? Do men have higher levels of estrogen and does that affect their testosterone, the testosterone levels and their balance? Um, so all of your patients that are having PMS and PMDD and 20 something year old men that have low testosterone, you want to start to think, could they have a mold exposure and a possible mycotoxin? Now, how do we look for mycotoxins in immunocompromised patients? Um, I actually, that, this is one of the things that I look into in every one of our patients is, are they immunocompromised? Do they have some type of immune deficiency? With the last two and a half years that we've gone through COVID, we were always trying to do things to support your immune system, like take vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc and quercetin. But what I'm looking at is actual objective values to see whether the patient is immunocompromised. One of the blood tests that we start with is something called a T and B lymphocyte level. So we're looking at T cells, we're looking at B cells. These are what I call your soldiers in your body. 
The next is we're looking at immunoglobulins, and those vary for immunoglobulin E, immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin G, and the subclasses, and immunoglobulin M. So IgG E, IgG M, IgG A, and IgG E um, are the immunoglobulins that we're looking for. If you have deficiencies in those or elevations, those can lead us to a specific problem with your immune system. The next one is something called cell mediated immunity testing. That is actually a board test where we have a, a board with a bunch of needles on it and you put it on the patient's arm and make an impression. And then we read that within 48 hours. And what that tells us is the overall function of your lymphocytes, specifically the T lymphocytes and B cells. Um, that is a, a good objective test that lets us know how well your soldiers are working. The other thing is to really understand and always be aware that you have to take a really good clinical history and specifically, you have to take a good environmental history. So we're gonna ask patients, um, do they have a history of autoimmune disorders? The most common autoimmune disorder that, especially in females um, that I see is thyroid problems. Usually they have underactive or low or hypothyroid. Um, many patients have been diagnosed with low thyroid and they've been on medications, but they've never been told why their thyroid is not working or functioning well. And that's when you need to ask your physician or your provider to um, check for antibodies to your thyroid, specifically looking for Hashimoto's or Graves disease. Then again, we're going to be going through their history and asking them what is their exposure to um, being on medications, specifically medications that suppress your immune system. So number one, the most common immunosuppressive that we use every day, I don't as much anymore, but I did when I was in general family practice, is steroids. If they've been on a Medrol dose pack or prednisone pack or get a shot of Kinolog or triamcinolone for their sinus infection or for their back pain or for their knee pain, uh, that is obviously steroids and then asthma as well. Um, steroids turn off the immune system and it makes people feel better. Um, but you, if you do that a lot, you're, you're really suppressing your immune system over a long period of time. And there are certain risks associated with that. There are disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, uh, DMARDs is what we call them for short, and tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, TNF inhibitors that are used in common autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, Shrogan's, lupus, polymyalgia rheumatica, Crest syndrome. These are different types of autoimmune disorders. And again, if something is going on with your immune system, if it's turning against an organ within your body or creating antibodies against that organ, that's what an autoimmune disorder is. And then the last one is unfortunate, but when patients get diagnosed with cancer, their options are usually to have surgery if it's something that can be easily resectable or do chemo and radiation. And chemo is the one that you have to be careful with because it is a treatment for cancer, but it also suppresses your immune system. And so if they've had any cancer history and chemo treatment, you're going to want to look at um, their immune system. So let's get into a quick case example. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of a patient that I saw this spring. Uh, I'm not going to give you her name, but her initials were JC, and she was a 47-year-old female, and she presented um, a, well over a month ago to me as a new patient. She had moved to Texas from New Mexico. So stop right there and think about what is the difference between Texas and New Mexico? Obviously size, but think of where she is. We're in Dallas, Texas. Lots of green, lots of lakes, lots of water. It's not as humid as Houston, but you know we, we have a lot of green, green trees and such and grass. So there's more pollens here. When she goes to New Mexico, it's either mountainous, snowy, or dry desert. Um, so she's not exposed to those types of um, pollens as frequently. So she was experiencing multiple symptoms, including allergic rhinitis or allergies, which she associated with pollen allergies because she moved here to Texas. She then developed a trunk and a pelvic pain. And she thought because she'd had a history of a kidney stone that she was having a recurring kidney stone. 
she had an evaluation for that and nothing was found on her x-rays or her abdominal exam. She'd seen her physicians and she tried multiple medications, including pain pills like opioids, anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxants and couldn't get relief of her truncal and pelvic pain. She thought she had a herniated disc in her back. She went to get an MRI and that was negative, even though she had no injury or trauma. Then at night, she started experiencing these weird neurological jerking movements at bedtime. And she was starting to develop insomnia because she couldn't sleep and it was waking her up. So you would start to think, does this person have restless leg syndrome or some type of you know, muscle jerking movement um, condition that was causing her to have insomnia? She noticed that um, her symptoms improved when she was working from home during the COVID pandemic. So that's a key part of her history is I got better when I left my workplace and came home and I was working from home during the COVID pandemic. Then when she returned to the store that she worked at, her symptoms reoccurred. And she stated that she started to have the neurocognitive problems where she was unable to organize while at work. And she even got written up at work for poor work performance. This was really disheartening and frustrating to her because she always said, I'm a good worker. I'm a good employee. I get stuff done. I'm dependable. And when she got written up, she knew there was something wrong with her brain. So she told me that the workplace was leaking water every time it rained and the workplace had visible mold on the walls. This workplace also had a bad odor. So if you smell mildew or if you smell a musky odor, you have to think there's mold growth there. What she did was actually try to go through her work, but eventually led to her calling a health inspector. And the health inspector came out and saw the mold growth on the wall. And he suggested treating, treating it with bleach, wiping it down with bleach and painting over the drywall with mold. So she told me other employees were also getting sick and they were leaving or in the hospital or seeing their doctors or quitting. And what she had done was put in several work tickets, which were requests to basically have the mold problem looked into and to get it fixed. And she did not have any resolve with that. Her employer just kind of ignored her. And that's what led her to call the health inspector. So right now she's currently applying for workers' compensation and the workplace is closed due to construction. So what she did was come and see us and we skin tested her. It's just an allergy test. It's called intradermal provocation neutralization. And she was found to have an allergy on her skin to molds naturally. We also did um, airway function test on her, which was through spirometry and showed that she had mild airway obstruction. Then we did a urine mycotoxin test and showed that she had mycotoxins in her urine. She said, where did I get these from? Well, if you've got a workplace with mold and you can prove that there's mold there, if you see it, if you know what kind it is, we can correlate that with the mycotoxins that are coming out of her urine. So this was her urine mycotoxin report. And this is a zoomed in, um, a zoomed in uh, table that you can see on all of our mycotoxin reports that come from clinical urine specimens. Unfortunately with JC, we had to go over these results. And what you can see is every mycotoxin was present. So we go in order, ochratoxin A, aflatoxin, trichothecene, gliotoxin and xeralinone were all considered present. You see that the specimen comes from their urine. The value is the actual level. And then the result is considered either present, not present or equivocal. And then you see where the lab ranges occur. So this is the second page of our mycotoxin report. And this is a good visual examination of where are they at. The easiest way to review this is wherever the blue dot is, that is the value of the patient's mycotoxin um, with, with the testing. And if there is a blue line, which is considered the equivocal, if you're above that blue line, you're going to be considered present or positive. And if you're below that blue line, you're going to be considered not present. So if you look at aflatoxin and trichothecene and xeralinone, her blue dot is above the blue line on the graph. So that means that she's present. But look at gliotoxin. 
and look at ochre toxin. Specifically, ochre toxin, the blue line is much thinner, and you can see that the graph is zoomed out, and her blue dot is almost to 10. And so when you're out of that gray zone, that's when you're in the white zone, which means you are off the charts high on ochre toxin. The aflatoxin, the trichothecene, and the zeralinone are either considered mild or moderate levels, but gliotoxin and ochratoxin are moving up there towards high values. The nice thing about this too is you see the collection date at the bottom, which is 328.22. When we recheck this in three months or six months, you'll have a line graph that will show you whether these results are improving and going down or are they going up if there's continued exposure. So when do we repeat a urine mycotoxin test? Well, I always tell patients foundationally what you have to do is figure out where did they get this exposure. Since it's unlikely that they ate something that was moldy, then they most likely got it from a building that they worked in or their home. So you have to be Sherlock Holmes and figure out is there mold within their environment? Do they smell mold? Do they see mold? And come up with that good clinical environmental history. Once you find out that the patient does have mycotoxins, you're gonna to want to either remove them from the moldy environment or get the moldy in environment treated and remediated and fixed. Um, and then you're gonna put them on your detox protocol to help with processing these toxins out of their body. And I usually give practitioners the recommendation of three to six months to repeat the test. And you'll also wanna be seeing them and assessing them and asking them, you know, are you feeling better? Have your symptoms improved or worsened? And then we'll measure the values and objectively see from their baseline mycotoxin. When you repeat it, does the, do the values look like they go down and improve? Now, how do we test our home or our work environment? Real-time lab also has a, a test kit called EMMA, which is like a little girl's name, but it stands for the Environmental Mold and Mycotoxin Test Assessment. And that is short for EMMA. So you can see here, there's little swabs um, that look like cute long Q-tips. There's three swabs in each kit and you can swab up to three areas. So you would treat your home the same way that you would treat your body. Mycotoxin poisoning always has a source. Obviously it's from mold. So you must treat the environment as well as your body in order to fully heal. The EMA test is different from an ERMI test, which I'm going to talk about in the future, but EMA test for, uh, it's a sensitive molecular detection technology that looks for the presence of 10 different toxigenic molds. And then it also determines how high those levels are in their relative abundance. Then we will correlate that by testing for 16 of the mycotoxins to see if those mycotoxins correlate with the molds that came back on your EMA testing. So where do you start? How do you find mold in your household? I'm a visual person and I like this diagram of this home, um, but you're gonna start to think of areas where there is moisture and wetness. So the most likely place you're gonna find mold in your house is gonna be hit with high humidity levels. Um, so you'd have to start thinking about bathrooms where you take a shower or a bath refrigerators that are cooled, but if you leave the refrigerator door open, then things start to condense. And also you put food in there. And if you leave food in there for too long and it molds, then it can get mold within the fridge. The laundry room, you'll have wet clothes or wet towels, or you have a bunch of pipes that, you know, put water through. So if you have a pipe that's leaking behind the drywall or at the sink, um, then you can have an increased risk of mold production. Any plumbing source, especially pipes, toilets, sinks. Um, and then the other big one is your HVAC systems, the ACs and the vents and the ducts. So any place that's also close to outdoor openings, such as windowsills or the doors or fireplaces and chimneys, and then roofs are especially vulnerable to molds. Again, we live in Texas and we are, have these huge Texas sized Texas thunderstorms that come through in the spring and summer. And we hate hearing when there's gonna be hail. So if there's golf ball or tennis ball or softball size hail, we know that the roofing people and the roofing companies are calling us because our, our shingles get so damaged 
on our rooftops that it can start to leak through the roof and it can go down the drywall through to the studs um, and the framing or you know all over the house so it is foundational that you have a good roof that doesn't have leaks in it so what is the emma versus the ermi uh, i get asked this question a lot by practitioners um, you know well should i recommend an ermi or do i do an emma the difference between an emma and an ermi is the emma is a dust sample like i say three types of swabs that you can swab the interior home or your office or a work building and it detects for the 10 mold organisms and the 16 mycotoxins that are produced from those molds the army does not test for the mycotoxins that cause the serious diseases in the bodies of the humans and the animals the emma also comes with a brief description that guides you on the mold's relationship to the mycotoxins and it gives you descriptions of the diseases and the symptoms in the area of the body that's affected by the mycotoxins so this is a quick results correlation um, of a lady, we call her grandma's bathroom. Um, she was living with her family and in grandma's bathroom, they thought they had a mold issue. So they took the Emma swabs and swabbed her bathroom. And we've highlighted here, uh, the stachybotrys mold came back positive on the Emma test. The DNA levels of relative abundance was close, well over 11,000 and the spore count was close to 17,000. The next part of your Emma test is gonna be the mycotoxin testing. And this correlates that the stachybotrys mold that she had growing in her bathroom produced trichothecene mycotoxins from the dust swab that they did. And again, it looks like it's present. It's well above um, 0.04, I'm sorry, 0 0.08 parts per billion, so. And then this is her urine test. So similar to the one that I showed you on JC, but this is her urine specimen. So if you have stachybotrys mold growing in grandma's house, producing trichothecene mycotoxin on a dust sample, that is your Emma test. And then if grandma is getting sick and we test her urine and she comes back positive for trichothecene, which comes from stachybotrys mold, then you are correlating her clinical evaluation and symptoms with her environment as well. So in summary, through RUPA, you can order our total mycotoxin panel. You can also order our Emma, and then we have our Candida panel for your patients to be evaluated. Always remember that molds and mycotoxins pose a serious threat to your patient's health and can often be dis dis disguised as a secondary disease. And in order to treat someone, who has mycotoxin poisoning, you have to not only treat their body, but their environment as well. Thank you for having me today. All right, y'all. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Seymour, for that presentation. And I appreciate y'all bearing with us at the beginning during those slight technical difficulties, but I'm glad to see you all made it here. Um, so, you know, with that, we will jump right into Q&A, and if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A or in the chat, and I will do my best to keep up. Um, but to start things off, this is more uh, of a question coming from, sounds like almost a, a patient who's joining us today, but uh, when they go see their doctor for an unwell visit, that mycotoxin testing is not part of the lab's order to find their problem. Uh, why do you think mycology is less important uh, than bacteriology? Well, <laughs> that could be a political statement too, but um, I will tell you in medical school and residency, um, I loved microbiology and I loved learning about different types of pathogens, but molds were very minimal. I remember hearing about a fungus ball that could grow into um, in, in a patient's lungs. And I thought, oh, that, that sounds disgusting. Yeah. Um, but how do you treat that? And, and as a family practitioner, that's generally something that's well out of your purview of care. And you would send somebody to a pulmonologist to have a bronchoscopy if that was some abnormal abnormality that was either heard or seen on their exam or their x-ray or their CAT scan. Uh, and so what I really think real time and environmental physicians like us that are aware of environmental problems are trying to do is educate everyone that mold is out there in the environment. And I think many clinicians either are, you just don't know what you don't know, or you're uneducated about it, or you're 
eyes are closed and your ears are closed and you're blinded and deaf to the fact that mold can affect human beings and it can also affect um, animals. That's why the EPA and, and there's, there's different terms like sick building syndrome. Um, but mold is out in the environment, especially if you're in wet and humid areas or flooded areas. So I think many practitioners will just kind of what I call poo poo it under the rug and push it under the rug and go, what's the big deal because molds outside, which it is, but what you don't want is mold inside a building. There are natural things outside like the sun with UV light and wind and ventilation that affect different levels of mold growth and mycotoxin production. Um, we don't have that within our homes and our buildings. We don't have UV light shining in to kill the mycotoxins. We try to control our environment and humidity levels with dehumidifiers and ACs and heat and mm -hmm. things like that, but um, not if you have a leak of water or if you have a flood or, or if you have some kind of damage. There's no way you can fix that unless you take care of the foundational problem. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, that is a really good question. And I think that a lot of physicians and providers are easily trained just to prescribe antibiotics all day. And that's easy to treat a bacterial infection. Viruses, we really don't have a lot of treatment for multiple viruses because those are usually something that we just say, oh, you know, you got the flu, supportive care, take some Tylenol, take some Motrin, take some vitamin C, rest, drink some water and, and you know, your immune system will kick it and you'll get over it. COVID kind of changed that a little bit, but um, the, the mycology is something that is just not really addressed. It's, it's um, not taught well in our institutions and in our education systems. And then the other thing that is commonly a problem is most physicians think that mold is just an allergy and they don't even know or realize or understand the toxic problems that occur from mycotoxin production from a mold. So, you know, they'll usually send the, your patients to an allergist, they'll do prick testing, or you can do blood testing for mold allergy. And you'll just say, we have an allergy to mold. Oh, okay. Well, what do I do for that? Well, standard allergists, including me, is going to say, avoid mold but how do you do that? So if I yeah. want to move down to Houston, or if I go live in New Orleans, which is flooded, old and hot and humid, and I start experiencing sinus infections, or I can't breathe, I'm, the first thing I'm going to think of is, do I need to go get an allergy test for mold? Do I have an allergy to mold? And it's not just avoidance, it's also desensitization with allergy shots or allergy drops or something called SLIT, which is sublingual um, immunotherapy. Um, but the toxin part, part is is generally the thing that's really missed with mold and mycotoxins and it's really unfortunate and sad that so many patients are um, affected with multiple conditions and they've seen multiple doctors and spent tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars and they run out of time money and energy and trust with their doctor um, when they can't figure it out and can't get better but I would definitely encourage all practitioners to be discussing about environmental histories and making sure that they haven't had floods or leaks or hail damage or smells of mold. And if they do consider a mycotoxin test. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a very complex issue, right? There's no just one solution to it because there's so many different environmental factors that you have to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be something that's even just hiding behind your walls that you can't even see. Um, correct correct it's, it's very difficult and so um i think that's why these types of conversations are, are so important um a lot of the questions that we're getting into um within the q a have to do a lot with you know what does your detox protocol look like um how are you managing the symptoms can you talk a little bit about you know what the treatment plans would look like and, and things of that nature sure so when patients come and see us uh we start with again looking at their immune system and seeing if there's a type of immune support that they need we have specific um immunotherapies that we prescribe that are patented and and help with t t lymphocyte supports um, we do skin testing and look for the allergy and the sensitivity component to the molds. If they are allergic to molds, we put them on allergy shots or allergy drops to desensitize them. And then um, 
the first thing foundationally, which I skipped over is to get out of the mold or to fix the mold or remediate the mold or stay home or go to work wherever the mold isn't. Yeah. And then the, the last thing is the detoxification portion of trying to get the toxins out of your body. And those can be multiple things. You can use certain supplements. Um, there's binders, uh, there's glutathione, there's IV nutrition, there's massage, there's sweating with exercise and sauna. There's making sure their bowel movements are, are going good, making sure they're hydrated and, and urinating, you know, and drinking plenty of water. Um, there's just a lot of ways to help these patients detox, but I always tell my patients, you will be a hamster on a wheel, spending a lot of time, money, and energy trying to detox, and you won't get much better and you won't get very far if you go back into a moldy environment, because you're going to continue to get exposed to the mycotoxins and the levels will go up and then they'll go down and then they'll go up and then they'll go down. And that's why you've got to get out of that environment or get that environment fixed. Yep. Yeah. You got to find where it's coming from. Um, would you treat these patients using uh, Sporanox? You can. Yeah. Antifungals are um, something if I, if we do cultures here as well. So if we have mm -hmm. cultures that show candida or some kind of fungus, then naturally an antifungal would be warranted. Um, I will say that it's kind of like Lyme disease. I don't put a lot of patients on, you know, heavy, big gun, atomic bomb kind of antibiotics to kill Lyme. I mean, the, the standard approach is if they get Lyme and they have a, a, a tick bite and they have a, you know, bullseye rash and they have symptoms and naturally you're supposed to treat them with some kind of antibiotic. But what I've seen is many practitioners use six months or a year's worth of, of you know, antibiotics and sometimes even big gun stuff like IV Rocephin for six months. And just, you know, it, it ruins the gut microbiome and it's not that antibiotics are not warranted. Same with as fungal infections. It's not that antifungals are not warranted. It's just, I don't like to use those for months and years at a time. Um, and that's where we come back to supporting your immune system. Maybe you need to practice a low candida diet. Maybe you need to be aware of the foods that you eat and how those increase the risk of fungal overgrowth. So yes, Spornox is something that you can try. We've tried Nystatin, we've tried Diflucan. Um, I've had requests for IV antifungals sometimes, and these are all things to consider. Great. Um, is there a way to determine uh, past exposure from a current mycotox test? No, unfortunately, I mean, unless you do the test years ago or, or months ago, th this test is a semi-quantitative test. We, we can't, we can't um, give you a time period of this was something you ate last week, or this was the hotel that you were in last month, or this was the home that you were in 10 years ago. There's no way we can objectively assess timing. But again, that's when you go back to your clinical history to see you know, I, I, I just hear it from patients. I grew up in a moldy, wet trailer in, you know, East Texas or something that was leaking all the time. Every time it rained, that's mold. I mean, I don't have to have a, a swab there to, to, to test it. If they see mold growing through drywall or if they see, you know, water stains and drip or if they smell it, it's mold. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are urine mycotox, uh, are urine, urine mycotoxins always related to clinical symptoms or they, can they be asymptomatic and tolerated as normal for that individual? They can be asymptomatic, um, but again, most of the time when patients come see us, they're having tons of symptoms or by the time they get to a point where they consider a mycotoxin test, they usually have multiple symptoms. But I have had like, for instance, a, a wife that, you know, had mold at her workplace and she tested herself. And then she said, Hey, honey, husband, like, you know, go get tested. And he may come back with positive mycotoxins, but he doesn't experience any symptoms. Um, I, I just tell people they're lucky if you don't have any symptoms, but you still can't turn your, turn your head and turn away from the fact that mycotoxins can affect the immune system. So I, I don't want to wait till someone gets cancer or an autoimmune disorder to go, Hey, you know, maybe you should have taken care of that mycotoxin. Um, before you got symptoms. Um, so yes, I always tell patients, whether you're symptomatic or not, you need to make sure that you're getting these toxins out of your body and avoiding exposure. Yeah. And that kind of leads into the next question here, not only just getting toxins out of your body, but the idea of treating or, or remedying mold in a household uh, can be 
you know, very expensive and, and, and cause stress on um, families. And especially if some families um, are only having certain members of the family experiencing uh, mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, do you have any tips on finding trustworthy ways to treat the homes? <laughs> no, no, is the yeah. short answer. Okay, so I am not a mold remediator. I am not an assessor. Um, Real Time Lab does have an environmental department where there's a person there that can give you specific things to look for. Um, like I say, some people will look for ERMI certified um, assessor, mold assessors, where they come in and they assess where do you have mold. Um, mm -hmm. it, again, a lot of politics and money, certain states will not allow you to be both an assessor and a remediator because there's a conflict of interest. If I made money off of telling you that you had mold and had to rip drywall out and renovate your whole house, that, well, then that's a conflict of interest. So generally sure. they're separated with uh, an assessor, someone who comes and evaluates and assesses how much mold you have versus a remediator who says, okay, this is how we fix the problem and this is how much it's gonna cost. And it is expensive. You're talking yeah. hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of homes that people are affected by this. and when I, when I say you have to get out of your house, that affects their, obviously their stress, but wh where do they work? Mm -hmm. where, where does their, where does their husband and their kids go? Where, where do the kids go to school? What if the housing market right now is crazy? What if they can't find a house? It's too expensive. So all those things we have to take into account. It's best if any, if anybody can try and um, remediate and salvage stuff, but sometimes these things are uninhabitable and sometimes they're unsalvageable. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, I personally do not recommend any specific company or person. Okay. Um, that is, I just, I don't, but you need to do your reviews and start asking your questions and you can speak with the people at our um, environmental department at real time. And on our website, there are certain people that we've um, kind of accredited that have taken courses and, and understand the importance of mold and mycotoxins and it's state specific. So, yeah, absolutely. Do your research. Do you do any uh, HLA DR susceptibility testing when uh, to see if somebody might be more genetically sensitive to mold? Yes, you can. I don't commonly do that um, because our testing shows whether they're sensitive or not, but this is kind of the question that I get. Again, I'll use a husband and wife as an example. If sure. they're living in the same home and there's mold and the wife is losing her mind and she's tired all the time and she's breaking out in hives and she can't breathe and this and that. And then she got diagnosed with hypothyroidism five years ago and Hashimoto's. And then the husband is sitting there asymptomatic and fine. And he goes, hey doc, why is she losing it? And I feel fine. Well, there are many variables of why someone can be sicker than another. Genetics plays a role. Um, the, the unfortunate thing with gene, gene testing, we can do a lot of it, check for you know detox pathways and MTHFR, and there are nutritional supports that you can give them, but I can't go in and genetically modify their genes. And I don't ever want to get to that point because that's where I start thinking that's borderline mad scientists. Yeah. Um, so you know, we do the best that we can. And I think that genetic testing is important. Um, but I, that's not the way I test because we do skin testing. We can prove if a wife is more sensitive to a mold or a mycotoxin versus a husband, um, because we all have our own bio individualities and it depends on how all these variables, how, how long were they exposed? What's their genetics? What do they eat? How do, how do they have bowel movements every day? How well do they detox? We're taking into multiple variables to see why someone is sick and why someone has mold contamination. I love that. I hope that uh, answers your question. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. So so I just want to give a quick heads up. We are at the, the hour mark. I know we got started a few minutes late. And, and Dr. Seymour, is it okay if we go through a cute few more questions? Sure, I want to make sure that we're okay with that. Perfect. Well, I appreciate y'all hopping on. If you do have to jump uh, at this time, no worries. Again, we do record all these sessions um, and we will go ahead and send that out to you as well as post it to rupertuniversity.com once we've had the opportunity to uh, do some edits to it. Um, so the last few questions here would be, um, how do you treat mycotoxins and sinus? Um, they're typically difficult. We d do nasal cultures and um, we see if there's any, well, what bacteria and if any fungal uh, components grow. 
Obviously, there could be viral components to that as well. And we can do your conventional route where you, you know, do antibiotics and steroids and nasal sprays and antihistamines. But again, most of our patients have already been down that route. They, it either didn't work or they don't want to continue to go down that route. Mm -hmm. um, we use nasal ozone insufflation, um, not where they're inhaling it in their lungs, but we make them take a deep breath and hold it and they'll have nasal ozone insufflation into the sinuses and also into the ears, that's a treatment that we can do as well. And then some practitioners will use antifungals like bag spray and um, things like that. Sinus washes, allergy shots, allergy desens desensitization helps prevent a lot of that um, mucus production and that plugging and that pressure that people get. So there's, there's lots of things. Some I think work better than others. Sure. How do you determine external sources versus internal colonization? Uh, well, again, we can do internal cultures and swabs, but um, I mean, the, the external source is gonna be from obviously any kind of exposure that you have in your environment. So again, is there a mold? Do you see it? Do you smell it? Have you tested for it? And then internal col colonization of molds, there is no major test for that like you can do a blood culture or you can do a stool culture. Um, if they go through scopes and you see fungus in their esophagus or their colon, then yeah, but um, there's not a lot of good tests for that. Some, some providers will do IgE um, antibodies to aspergillus and candida. And that really just shows a history of exposure. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily show active colonization. Yeah, and the last two questions we have here would be, um, could you please comment on passing of mycotoxin illness in utero, utero through the birth canal? <laughs> well, I don't have a study that I can comment on that, but um, you know, obviously the, the placenta is the thing that protects the baby from the mother's um, blood and, and toxins and, and every, everything. Um, so that placenta is extremely important, but there are no human studies or trials that can comment on that. But again, if it can come through breast milk and it's coming out of your urine because it's in your blood, I don't know. I've, I've never done a mycotoxin test on a newborn baby and had a mom that did a urine test in utero. It would be something I'd like to look at. Yeah, um, but it would be very disheartening if you had a newborn that came back positive for mycotoxins on their first void. And then that's, that's a study you can set up and probably publish. And it's going to be very controversial, but it's, you know, it's the facts of the reality and the truth of the matter is if a pregnant mom is living in a moldy apartment and her baby's sick and she has a premature delivery, um, could mold and mycotoxins have caused that? high probability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then this last question that I have here, uh, I'm, I'm just more so honestly curious about this one. I was a dad of two dogs. Uh, what symptoms do you typically see in dogs and cats? And uh, can you test these, these animals? We can test animals. I'm just going to put the disclaimer out there. I'm not a doctor of veterinary medicine. Right. Um, well, I say so, this one for last. Yeah, yeah. 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 But here's what I hear. When patients call us and want to go over their results or doctors call us and want to go over their patient's results and what does it mean and how do they interpret and how do they, what do they tell their patients to do or, or where, what's the next step? Uh, we always get, well, my dog is sick my dog has a rash or the hair is falling out or they got cancer or they have allergies. Um, again, I'm not a doctor of veterinary medicine, but if your dogs start or your cats start to get sick, if you have mold exposure and you have mycotoxins, they're just as much a mammal as we are and they can inhale it, they can ingest it um, and it can go through their, their skin too. So and then again, this is where we're opening up this niche area of um, veterinary medicine. I'd love to find a functional vet or a holistic vet that that addresses this um, because it will affect your horses, your cows, your um, dogs and cats, but specifically domestic animals because they're inside. And if you have mold um, and mycotoxins, they're high probability of getting sick. There was actually a study 
that came out, um, Purina dog food, it was a couple, maybe four or five, four, three or four years ago, um, that their dog food, unfortunately, that was produced by the Purina, the dog food company, had aflatoxin. And there was about 80 or 90 dogs that died from oh. ingesting aflatoxin. And I, I don't know the legal semantics of what happened and how that feed got contaminated with aflatoxin, but obviously the dogs passed away and yeah. you know, that's, it's heartbreaking. So I have dogs and I don't want my dogs to die or have no. mycotoxin poisoning. Yeah, that would be tough. So, you know, with that, Dr. Seymour, that is the time we have for today's presentation. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. And also, of course, a big thank you to Real-Time Laboratories. Do you have any final thoughts or, or uh, thank yous to get out there? Uh, no, I just always encourage practitioners, you know, keep your head up and, and listen to your patients. And um, you're always going to be a Sherlock Holmes and a detective. And you have to keep digging deeper to really find out what the problem is. And um, it's a very empowering and fulfilling job that I do to see patients every day and to work with real-time lab. I truly feel like we're changing the world and we're helping um, everyone realize that, you know, mold and mycotoxin can be really bad and not something that you just brush under the rug and walk away from. So. Absolutely. Uh, it can directly impact your life for years, yes. really, really finding out what the root cause is. So. Yes. Um, again, thank you so much uh, for today. What we're going to do, folks, for those of y'all who are able to stick around for a few minutes, is I see these chats coming in and these questions coming in is, hey, how do I order these tests? How much does the test cost? That's what we're going to do now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and transition into Rupa Health, and I'm going to show you exactly how to order these tests that Dr. Seymour talked about during today's presentation. Um, so for those of you who joined late or haven't had the opportunity to see Rupa before, my name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. And so what I'm going to show you just very quickly is exactly who Rupa is, what we are, um, why do we do what we do, right? So Rupa Health is actually a functional medicine lab platform. So our goal in life is to make functional medicine more accessible to the world. Right now, there are a ton of pain points. And so for you as a practitioner, if you're ordering from multiple different labs or even just one lab, right, we will make life easier for you. And the way that we'll do that is by having one single login to give you access to over 30 different labs in one place. So what I'm showing you right now is just the lab catalog. And within catalog, you can search from over 30 different labs, over 3000 different tests, of course, including real-time labs that we just came on today. And you can order all the labs that Dr. Seymour spoke about, but also you can order from labs like Dutch, Genova, Doctors Data, Diagnostic Solutions, really any functional lab test that you're looking for can be found in our platform. And so now when you're ready to place an order, you can go to one place and order all your tests. So to place an order on Rupa, you just go to rupahealth.com, create an account for free. You just need your patient's first name, last name, and email address, and it'll bring you right into this order screen here. Within your order screen, you can create custom panels and custom bundles of sets of tests. Down below, you can create a favorites list of just individual tests that you commonly order from any one of the labs that we work with. You can put a little heart next to it, so it appears right here at the top. And when I'm ready to order, um, let's go ahead and order the Emma test, and let's go ahead and order the mycotoxin panel from uh, Real time labs. I just go click, click all those tests are right here at my fingertips, but maybe I also want to order a GI effects from Genova or maybe an uh, oat from Great Plains. I can go ahead and do that straight away. Again, the idea here is to give you all the labs and tests that you're looking for in one place from all the top labs out there in the industry. If you are looking for a specific test, you can find that right down below. Once those kits are ordered into your cart, it's as simple as clicking send a patient. So what does it cost? Well, at Rupa, we charge the wholesale practitioner prices. So what that means is the same price that you would get going directly to the lab, getting that discounted practitioner price. Those are the same prices we offer here at Rupa Health. So we're the same cost as you would be working directly with the labs. If your patient were to be referred directly to the labs, oftentimes they might be paying a higher price. Um, so again, just to reiterate, if we're having billing and we're managing billing directly with your patients, then we're potentially saving your patients hundreds of dollars through working with Rupa Health. The way that we generate our revenue is very simple. We charge a 7% processing ordering fee on each order, and this is paid for by whoever's paying for the test. So what I mean by that is you have two options here at Rupa. You can have us bill the patient directly, and so that way you don't have to manage any billing with the patient. If that's the case and the way that you want to manage billing, then we will charge the patient this 7%, in this case, $34, $35, right? Which means for you as a practitioner, Rupa is free. 
This 7% processing and ordering fee is the only way that Rupa generates our revenue. And so if you're having us consistently manage the billing directly with your patients, then Rupa will be free for you. You, of course, do have the alternative option of paying for the tests yourself, in which case you'll go ahead and just bill the patient separately outside of our platform. From there, you can add notes for the patient, you can add notes for Rupa, you can add ICD-10 codes as well. But again, if nothing else, it's as simple as clicking send a patient. And that's how you're able to place an order from 30 plus labs over 3000 different tests all in one place in a matter of seconds. So not only are you able to order all your tests in one place, but of course you're able to track and manage all of your results in one place. So hopping into here, you can search for your specific patients, you can filter by status of your different orders, and then I can hop down here and open up an order and see exactly what the status of each of my um, labs is. So I can see, for example, when the samples arrived at the lab, when I can expect the results to come in. And once those results are in, you receive an email that you can download the results in. You can send the results to your patient. You can even schedule a clinical consultation. So should you need some assistance interpreting the results, you can go ahead and schedule some time directly with the lab uh, and work with one of their clinicians to uh, dive a little bit deeper into the results that you're receiving. Again, just to reiterate, y'all, Rupa is free to sign up for. Uh, currently, you do have to be a licensed practitioner with an NPI located in the United States. So we do not work anywhere else outside of the United States at this time. Hopefully, we will in the future. But the next thing I want to show you about Rupa is not only is it just a place where you can come on and order all your tests, but it's also a place where we will manage the patient experience end to end. So another big pain point that I hear from practitioners has to do with the time that it takes to manage the patient experience, things like support, specimen issues, coordinating phlebotomy. I see that coming in from the chat, Jennifer. I, I will go over that in just a moment. Um, but all these things ultimately will take time out of your day. And so what we've done is built out a solution that will handle the entire patient experience for you. So as soon as you place that order, like I just showed you, we can effectively take it from there. We'll ship the kits out directly to your patients, drop ship kits, so you don't have to um, stock any kits in office anymore. But if you do prefer that, there's much more to come on that. Um, we'll send over FAQs, instructions, oftentimes videos to the patients um, on how to take the tests. We'll handle any support questions they have. So we do have a full patient support team as well as practitioner support team if you need assistance there um, that will manage any support questions from your patients uh, as well as we'll handle any specimen issues. Additionally, we will help coordinate phlebotomies. The phlebotomy costs will vary depending on the lab that they're working with, the location of them, if they want them in person versus a mobile phlebotomy. There's a few variables to consider when it comes to a blood draw. But with that, we'll always be transparent with your patient about any additional costs that will be associated with things such as a blood draw. We'll follow up with the patient and then ultimately you're notified via email as the results come in. So what does that all look like? This is the communication that will be sent to your patient as soon as you place an order. So hi, Joshua, Dr. Jordan has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are. And then one really important thing to call out here is that um, we accept multiple different payment options. So one of the ways that we're helping to lower your barrier to get access to these expensive tests, right, is providing these different payment solutions. So not only can we accept cash and credit, but we can also accept HSA, we can accept FSA, and we can also even set up an interest-free payment plan with your patients, in which case the kits will be sent out after the very first installment. From there, we'll collect all the necessary information to complete the order, billing, shipping, demographic. Uh, we'll highlight the tests and the cost of any tests that were ordered. And then from there, we'll go ahead and ship the kits out. If you decide to pay for the order, if that's how you prefer to manage billing, Nothing changes for the patient experience. The only difference here is that we will not show the cost of the test, right? Since you're managing billing directly with the patients, we're not going to show the cost of what you paid for those tests. From there, we'll alert the patient when the kits are shipped out, and then we will send over an email that looks very similar to this. So this email will outline instructions for each one of the tests that were ordered for them. Um, if they have any questions, they'll reach out to our team. We'll walk them through how to fill out the requisition form. And then if there is a blood draw required, we will help coordinate that phlebotomy with them. We'll send over resources for them to reach out to. But let's say that the patient wants maybe a mobile phlebotomist. They want somebody to come to their office or to their house to draw their blood. If those are available, we'll search by zip code and we'll send over any options available to them within their area. So again, we'll take care of all the questions. Of course, if it's anything medical related, we'll send them back your way. You can see an example of the instructions over here on the right-hand side that we've created for the Dutch complete test. So as you can see, they're very comprehensive, um, but in my experience, what's, what's equally as important to the content within them is the fact that they're user-friendly. 
Um, you can click around in different sections to see what um, is important to them and, and key details, collection instructions, so on and so forth. Um, and then from there, we'll follow up with the patient, see if they have any questions, and then you are alerted via email where you'll hop right back into the main dashboard to see everything. Over here, if you're following my mouse on the left-hand side is where you just navigate through Rupa. So Rupa University, for example, you're all actually a part of Rupa University not right now. Um, these are the live classes, right? So educational content that Rupa creates is a part of Rupa University. So live classes like the one that you're in right now with Dr. Seymour and, and real-time labs are a big part of what we do here. So you can see all the previous classes that we've done. You can join them live. And if you happen to miss one, we always record that and upload it into our library here. Additionally, we have more in-depth things like boot camps, where you can hop in and join a boot camp with Dr. Kerry Jones, who is our head of medical education here at Rupa Health. Six weeks, uh, deep dive, uh, you'll sign up. This is a paid opportunity here, so you would pay for this boot camp, but it's an opportunity for you to hop in and join live to learn how to interpret results. They oftentimes come with a free test as well. So you join a boot camp, you get a free kit, uh, you do it on yourself, and you're able to walk through and, and, and interpret those, uh, the, those uh, results live with a class, um, ask questions live. They're really cool. I've joined them a few times. Um, we have a phlebotomy map, right? So if you are interested in, in seeing what's in your area, we have a full map of phlebotomy. If you're interested to see what labs you can order from based on your license type, we have ordering access, full support. Our support team here is amazing. You can always reach out to them, just this little chat box here. They'll get back to you in under 30 minutes. Um, and you can even customize your settings a bit as well. So things such as uh, adding a team member. So if you're a part of a larger team or you have an admin or multiple practitioners in your clinic, you can invite them to join. You'll all have your each individual logins for the dashboard, but you're able to hop in and order kits all from the same platform. So you're able to track everything in one place. Additionally, we even have EHR integrations. So if you are working with an EHR such as Practice Better or Elation or Optimantra and many more to come, we will be able to just go ahead and, and upload those results straight into your uh, EHR. So making things even easier. I mean, really that is the goal of Rupa Health. Uh, the goal with us is to make life easier when it comes to lab testing. And ultimately that will lead to easier access to getting testing uh, for patients, right? That's the goal I think of everybody here. So um, with that, y'all, my name is Adrian Martinez. Um, I saw a couple of questions come in through the chat, but if you do have anything or want to set up some time with me, this is my email address as well as my phone number. Feel free to give me a call, shoot me uh, an email. If you do want to set up some time, I'll go ahead and send over uh, a follow-up email this afternoon. So you'll get my email through that as well. But again, thank you guys so much for, for joining this afternoon. So what is the cost for blood labs, phlebotomy? So, so the cost will vary. Um, one thing that's really cool that I didn't have the chance to show is if you are interested in hopping on and, and like comparing tests in this Discover Labs tab, you can just hop in to see the full catalog and I can actually compare labs as well. So I can hop in here and I can compare tests and I can actually select different tests that I want to compare and I can add them into a comparison sheet and it'll break down everything from uh, costs to different biomarkers that are being checked. I'm just going to pick the top three ones that we have here and you can see the whole comparison breakdown. So it's a really way, good way to hop in and, and get an understanding and learn what different labs are out there and see what we have to offer. Um, the, turnaround uh, the turnaround time of the kits received. Um, so the turnaround times are the exact same through Rupa than they would be if you were to be ordering directly. And so with that, the turnaround times will vary based on the lab that you're working with. Um, and so you actually can see that as well. So let me hop back to the main dashboard here. And if I click on the details of any one of my tests, I can see things such as the details, of course, right? But sample type, if a flood is required, and then turnaround time. So what the shipping time looks like, what the average sample time looks like. Of course, this will vary based on lab, based on location, based on your location. There's a number of things to consider, but we make this information and data as accessible as possible for you. Um, so what if a patient's located in Canada? So... Yeah, this one's a bit complex, but no. So so I should actually have been a little bit more clear with my my words earlier in terms of who can sign up for Rupa. So, so currently you do need to be a licensed practitioner within the US um, and we can only pay, uh, work with patients in the US as well. So the patient's address does need to be located in the United States. Um, you know, again, hopefully we'll have more expansion internationally in the future. Um, additionally, if you are a practitioner who is unlicensed currently, um, 
I know it is boo. I can't trust me. Canada is, I, I, I want Canada. Uh, I hear a lot of feedback from Canada. We have some amazing partners up in Canada. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get up there soon. Um, but if you are a practitioner whose license type might be limiting in your ability to order certain labs or any labs in general, um, you know, let's take a natural path in Florida, for example, right? Um, we are coming out with a program called Physician Authorization in the next couple months here. And what that will be is a signing MD who will be able to uh, place orders on your behalf. Um, and so you'll be able to order from labs, which you're qualified to order from. Um, and with that, it will open up a ton of opportunity, not only for practitioners, but for patients as well. So we're extremely excited about that. And I think a really big thing to call out about Rupa Health is um, we're a technology company. And so the product that you're seeing on the screen right now is going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to improve and new features and functions are going to always be put out because our goal is to build the best platform available for um, everyone that's involved in the lab testing atmosphere, right? And so all these products, all the, all the things that you're seeing on your screen right now um, is not the complete version. So that's something that I'm very excited about and, and keep an eye out and keep an ear out for some amazing new features and functions to come in the in the coming months as well as some amazing partnerships. But with that, y'all, thank you so much again for joining. And for those of you who were able to stick around through the presentation the whole way through, I appreciate you very much. Um, RupaUniversity.com, if you uh, have any questions, reach out to me. Sarah, I would love to connect with you as well. Um, I'm going to copy your information. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, reach out to you once we're available in Canada. But again, y'all, here's my information. Thank you so much. Have an amazing rest of your Wednesday. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you next week. Talk soon.